Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this time of worship. Welcome here into this sanctuary. This is a place of rest. This is a place where God comes to meet with us, and we meet with him, and are renewed in our relationship with him and with one another. It's so good to see you all. This is also the first time we're um, trying two services on a Sunday morning, a 9 a.m. and an 11. So thank you for coming out to this 9 a.m. service. It's really good to see you all. Uh, Just a few announcements before we move into our service. Um, And mostly that's about our safety guidelines. It's just important that we reaffirm these periodically, especially with um, much of Canada experiencing a second wave. We just need to be safe together in our gatherings. So just a reminder that when singing, you need to wear a mask. When you're not singing, you don't have to wear one but one thing you do. And then secondly, the other important thing to know is that when the service is over, we ask that you uh, go outside into the parking lot and if you want to connect with one another, uh, thankfully it's a lovely day and you can do so outside. Um, But between our services, we're going to have a cleaning of our building and so we just need to focus on that and so I encourage you to, to connect outside with one another. Let's take a moment to begin our service by just being still and attuning our spirit to the voice of the Good Shepherd. Let's pray. As the deer pants for streams of water, so our souls pant after you, God. Our souls thirst for God, for the living God, for you, O Lord. When can we go and meet with you? We are here, Lord God, to be with you as you come to be with us. We pray that you quench our thirst with the living water that is Christ. We pray, too, that you'd send forth your light and your truth to lead us this morning. Let them be our guides as we seek to serve you faithfully at such a time as this. We pray all this in Christ's powerful name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, please stand. We gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who promise that when two or three gather in his name, he's come to, he comes to be with us. Receive his greeting for you this morning. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Remain standing, we'll begin by singing together a song. We introduced this song not too long ago, so if you happen to know it, if you've heard it on the radio and you want to sing along, feel free to sing along with us. If not, just listen to it, read the words. It's a beautiful song and it's very fitting for this time that we're living in right now.
You may be seated. As we reflect on the faithfulness of God and the truthfulness of God, we remember what the Bible says about God, that in Him there is no darkness at all, but that God is light. That means that God is holy and that God is good. And my amp is not. <laughs> And it's in God's light that we come to have an honest view of ourselves. And we see that there is indeed darkness in us that needs to be brought out into his light. And the particular sin that I want us to reflect on and confess today is the sin of hypocrisy. The way that we hide our true selves and put on a show so as to attain status from peers or other Christian friends. Let's take a moment to bring this out into the light in prayer. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, our Savior and King, you have called us to walk in the truth, to walk in the light as you are in the light, to pursue a life of integrity and authenticity, following after you on the road of service. But we confess that all too often we take a different path we want to look good, be perceived as good. We fear losing face. And so all too often we put on a show to garner the praise of our peers. Sometimes we even leverage our religious devotion to help us secure honor and respect. Oh Lord, have mercy upon us. And we ask now, Lord Jesus, that you would tear down the act that has become our life and rebuild us on the foundation of your truth. Help us to live simple lives characterized by integrity, purity of heart, and a desire to bring glory to your name. We ask this in Christ's name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, God is light and in him is no darkness at all, but as the scriptures promise us that as we walk out into the light, as we confess our, sh our sins before God and one another, the truth is that we have fellowship with one another, and the atoning death of Jesus Christ covers over all our sin. Know today that you are forgiven. Let's rededicate ourselves to God at this time by, by standing up and by singing another song together. Lord of Lords, this song directs us out of ourselves into worship of the triune God. Please stand.
We turn in the Bible at this time to Matthew chapter 23. All this fall, we've been following Jesus and learning from him. We've been taking his yoke upon him, uh, trusting that he is gentle and that he is good, and that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Today is also uh, close to the day after Reformation Day, and uh, there's a little Reformation themes in this passage as well, and I'll be pulling those out in my sermon. Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends of Jesus Christ, you don't have to have a counseling degree to know that Jesus is in a rather serious mood, angry even, you might say. Matthew 23 contains Jesus' longest and sharpest critique of the religious establishment in Israel. Woe to the hypocrites, Jesus says. He calls them blind guides. He calls them vipers. He calls them whitewashed tombs. He says, you're shiny white on the outside, but dead on the inside. If we were to keep reading Matthew 23, we'd hear all these really, really sharp critiques. It's a little unnerving to hear such sharp verbiage from the mouth of our Lord. Isn't this the man who told us to turn the other cheek and to love our enemies? Yes, it is. But evidently, a different approach is needed when corruption and hypocrisy make inroads into church leadership. Corrupt shepherds can lead the sheep off course, and this is something that the Lord of the church will not tolerate. And so, just as Jesus overturned the money tables in the temple, so now he overturns the facade of the Pharisees. To understand the force of Jesus' words, let's take a moment to remember the context here. Ever since Jesus rode into town uh, riding a donkey, the religious leaders have been trying to trip him up. They are doing this not because they are interested in the truth. They are doing this because they are jealous of the attention that Jesus is getting. People used to come to them for teaching, and now they are going to Jesus. People used to call them rabbi, and now they are calling Jesus rabbi. This man has to be stopped, they think to themselves. But what is a spiritual leader's main job? Is the goal of spiritual leadership to protect and retain one, one's own seat of honor? Or is the goal of spiritual leadership to discern truth, promote truth, and help God's people live in the light of God's truth? These exchanges between Jesus and the Pharisees in the temple, they're, they're revealing. They reveal the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the authority and wisdom of Jesus the Christ. And if there's one thing that Jesus has absolutely no patience for, especially in leadership, it's hypocrisy. Hear his words again. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. 
They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, and they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. The first thing I noticed about Jesus' sharp critique is that he begins with respect for the office that the teachers of the law hold. These people sit in Moses' seat, he says. You must listen to them. They open the word of God. They interpret the word of God. Listen to them. They might be hypocrites, but it's still the word of God that they are opening and speaking aloud. Jesus shows that he is conservative here before he is a radical. He tells his disciples to respect the office bearer insofar as they are doing the job that they are supposed to do, which is to open, to teach, and explain God's word. Listen to them, but, here's the caveat, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. This really is the chief complaint that Jesus has against the Pharisees. They open the book in the synagogue. They make a real show out of it. They do a really good job preaching it, proclaiming it, teaching it, applying it, but then they don't live according to it. They apply the law in a rigorous way, paying every attention, or attention to every jot and tittle, but they won't get down off their high pulpit to actually help the people grow up in the faith. Some of you, I'm sure, had um, perhaps a parental figure in your life that, that did a lot of pontificating on you, right? Do better, do better, make your bed better, uh, clean your room better, um, wash your teeth better, do your hair, your, you know, everything just up from on high, coming down upon you, saying, do this, do that, do this, do that. But they wouldn't come down to join you and to show you what it looks like to do those things well. So they kept a high bar, but they weren't of any help. And I think that's what Jesus is saying here. These religious leaders, they're really good at interpreting the scriptures, but then they don't get down off the pulpit into people's lives to actually help lead them towards wholeness. Spiritual leadership is about servant leadership. It's about setting a bold goal and then walking with the flock to help the whole community move towards that goal. But for the religious leaders, the weekly Bible readings have become an academic exercise, a way of proving their seriousness so as to maintain and uh, or attain more honor. Everything is done for people to see, Jesus continues. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets, the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. So phylacteries, if you've never heard that term before, were these little uh, boxes that serious Jews um, tied on their arms and, and placed over their foreheads. These little boxes contained um, pieces of parchment paper, and on the parchment paper were written verses from the Old Testament. Serious Jews did this because Moses told them in Deuteronomy to keep the law always before them, to, to place it over their hearts, to keep it before their eyes. Tassels performed a similar function. Jewish men and and women sewed them to the four corners of their robes to remind them to live within the bounds of the Ten Commandments. And physical symbols, I mean, sometimes we wear them too, like the big one for Christians is a cross. They can be important, uh, helpful reminders in our life of following Jesus. But they cease to be a holy help for sanctification when they become accessories used to impress our peers and to gain status. You can see how this will work. You just sort of enlarge your phylactery box a little bit, and it lets everyone know that there's a lot of Bible passages in there and that you're super serious about your faith. Or maybe when you're hemming the tassels on your robe, you make them a little extra long so that as you're walking through the city, people see, oh, look at how long his tassels are. He must be really serious about following the Ten Commandments. Everything they do is for people to see, Jesus says. But holiness is not really what they're after. They're after the seat of honor. They want to be revered by their peers. Hello, most excellent rabbi. What a large phylactery box you've got there. 
Sociologist Jonathan Haidt has noted that status is what people, what humans jostle for after our needs for, for food and shelter are met. After survival, our strongest drive is the drive for honor. We want to look good. We want to be respected. And if the appearance of religious devotion or ordination will help us with that, then we'll, re- we'll leverage those things to gain status in our community. This was a totally pernicious problem in Jesus' day. You can even see it happening within Jesus' own ranks. The disciples are constantly arguing. It's literally constant. They're constantly arguing about who will be the greatest. Who will sit on Jesus' left and Jesus' right? Who will have the seats of honor in the kingdom of God? And while I'd like to say that we've outgrown this unholy drive, that probably would not be true. I think about this sometimes when I gather with other pastors at conferences or luncheons. You should hear the kinds of conversations that we pastors get into when we get together. Sometimes, of course, the fellowship is pure and the encouragement is good, but other times we tend to tell big fish stories about our congregations. We stretch the numbers to highlight our successes. We're looking for the applause of our peers. The growth of our church is a little like an enlarged phylactery box on our arm or forehead. If things are going well, we show it off. And if things are going poorly, we keep quiet and hide. Honor, protecting our pride, appearing good, saying all the right things in the right way so as to secure applause. Deep down, this is what we want. And this sort of thing drives Jesus absolutely bonkers. He hates it, hates it, when spiritual leaders sacrifice integrity for the sake of the show. And not just leaders, but all his people. It will not be this way with you, Jesus says to his disciples. You are not to be called rabbi. For you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teachers, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If there's one sermon that Jesus preaches almost more than any other sermon. Maybe he talks about the kingdom of God more than this. But this last point, he repeats this all throughout the Gospels. Now on the surface here, it appears as though Jesus is uh, taking taking the axe to hierarchy in his church. The only office for the brother or the sister is that of brother and sister. There will be no one among you you call pastor, pastor, or domine, right? Nothing like that. No, only brother, only sister. But that's not exactly right. Jesus isn't abolishing the offices of the church. What what he's doing is instructing his disciples about, about what holding office will look like for them. He's saying it's not about the title. Don't lean on the title Don't leverage your position to gain status in my community. Yes, some of you will be teachers, but the role of the teacher in the body of Christ is not, is not to draw a crowd and earn respect as a great orator of the faith. The goal finally and forever is to direct people to the teaching of Jesus. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, Jesus says. That's the mission of the faithful teacher. And yes, some of you will be father figures in the church. You'll be elders over the body. Elders have the fatherly role of helping God's family grow into maturity. But good fathers do not leverage their role for honor. Rather, they use their authority to serve. It's about pointing people to the fatherhood of God and encouraging them to remain faithful to their father in heaven. The point is clear. Leadership in Christ church is about service, not status. What's needed is integrity, not theater. 
the greatest among you will be your servant. As I was uh, preparing the sermon, I, I remembered a book I had read uh, a few years ago on Martin Luther, the German reformer. He was alive uh, at the same time that a, um, a man named Pope Leo was a Pope of the Catholic Church. Um, pope Leo's original name was Giovanni de Lorenzo de Medici, and um, he, he was given the job of Pope in um, 1513. He took the name Pope Leo, but uh, Pope Leo wasn't a, a churchman. He was never form previously a priest in the Catholic Church. He was just part of a, a big family, and the church had a lot of power back in that time. There was whole sections of Italy that were papal states that were basically ruled by the pope. And so when you're part of a family that has power and money, one of the ways you get power and money is by joining the church and by going up the ladder in the ecclesiastical offices. So pope, the pope wasn't actually a priest. He was just a man, a politician, really. And I'm, I don't know much about Pope Leo, so I'm not going to say too much bad about him, but I will mention a few things that, that were not good about his leadership. Within two years of becoming Pope, Leo had drained the Vatican's bank account. He spent it all on music, the arts, church architecture. He gave money to friends in high places, especially family members that needed a helping hand to retain their positions of power in their cities. He lived excessively. Staying in the black was difficult for Leo. He ended up selling statues of the apostles and some of the papal jewels in order to stay solvent. He began looking for other income streams. Eventually, he discovered and leveraged the usefulness of indulgences. And he massaged that practice to help it become even more profitable. He wanted to finish St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So he took money, found a way to get money from the people who were looking for comfort from their, from their churches. And it was this practice, along with, along with others, other examples of corruption, that led Martin Luther to nail his 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg 503 years ago. Something is wrong in the church of Jesus Christ when the leaders of the church have storehouses of jewels that they can sell for money. Something is very wrong in the church when the leaders use fear tactics to raise money for their own projects. Martin Luther was right to confront this abuse of power. And of course, Pope Leo is sort of an easy target, and even Catholics will point that out at times. But I think this passage calls us to look at ourselves more than anyone else. It forces us to ask questions as Christ's disciples. How am I using the power that God has given me? Am I using the titles of pastor or reverend to build up my own status? Or am I using them in the service of God and neighbor? The greatest among you will be your servant, says Jesus. And those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I think the Apostle Paul is a good role model for us. He, more than anyone in Scripture, made the shift from a life of seeking status to a life of selfless service, and he did it well. Before Paul's conversion, he was quickly climbing the religious ranks. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He used to pride himself in his faithful observance. But then his life was upended by Christ, and he came to see that all that former stuff was, was as garbage in comparison to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. And for the rest of his life, he poured himself out for the mission of the gospel, and he became a servant of all so as to win some to the way of Jesus. We have one teacher we have one master. We have one God and Father. And all those who lead, who are called to lead, are to use their gifts and power 
to direct people, not to themselves, but to Jesus Christ, who sits on the throne. Let's together forsake the pursuit of status and follow instead the example of Christ. Jesus, the true King of Kings, did not use his power to lord it over people. Absolutely not. Rather, he poured out his life for us and for our salvation. He used his power in the service of, of God and neighbor. Let's follow him doing the same. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful today that we can speak to you without the need of going through some sort of hierarchy, but that we can come to you as we are. And we can do that because of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Master, our Teacher, our Savior. And Lord, we pray that as you have called your disciples into humble service, that we would hear the call today and um, lend our strength and our power and our position for, for service in your, in your kingdom. And Lord, if there's any hypocrisy in us, or any theater or show, or any desire for a seat of honor, we pray that you would redirect us, um, not upwards, but downwards, into quiet and faithful service. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's stand and let's sing together. We are people on a journey.
be seated. We take some time to pray together to intercede for our church and the world. Um, just a few um, announcements about that. We'll be praying for. Um, I talked to Dina Shoemaker this this past week, and um, her daughter Joanne, who has been suffering for a long time, was taken off a of life life support, and she passed away on on Thursday. Uh, so we'll pray for Dina, her family, and um, yeah, Joanne's family as well. Uh, Henry Yonker, an update on him. Um, as many of you know, he was diagnosed with cancer about six weeks ago. Um, his condition is very serious. He's currently in the hospital, and they're going ahead with a second round of chemo. Um, they see that as the best way forward, but it's hard on his body, and it's been really, a uh, really difficult journey for him. So we continue to pray for him and Steen and for God's intervention and miraculous healing, either through medicine or just through God's power. We'll pray for him today. And there's uh, also Hans and Lene Brinkert. Um, Hans continues his, uh, to be cared for in hospice. Um, I've been able to go see him, which is a real gift. Um, I'm allowed into hospice, the hospice section of the hospital. So I've seen him about once a week, and um, he is getting nearer to death, but it's, it's a slow journey. So we continue to pray that, that God will come take him to be with him soon. We'll pray for Lene as well. And of course, there's always uh, the important election in the states as well as the ongoing pandemic. And uh, what, uh, for much of the Western world, is definitely we're in a second wave. So we want to pray for that too. Let's spend some time in prayer. And we'll finish by uh, saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our good God and Father, we come before you now as your children, to speak the things that are on our mind and our hearts. We start with praise, Lord, for you are good, and your love endures forever. You've shown your faithfulness over and over through all generations, but especially through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us to bear witness to him in these days at such a time as this. Lord, we want to lift up to you some of the things that we see and are experiencing in our church family and world. We start by praying for Dina Shoemaker and the, um, the loss she is experiencing right now with the death of her daughter. Minister your comfort, your grace, and your peace to her and her whole family and to Charlie, who was Joanne's partner for many, many years. Lord, we pray for Henry Yonker now and for the Yonker family. Lord, we continue to ask boldly that your power um, would be seen here and that there could be healing and redirection with this cancer, Lord. We pray that this medicine, this second round of chemo, would go better than the first and that Henry's body would re receive it better. Um, strengthen him, Lord, we pray, and continue to give him uh, just deep assurance of who he is and who he is in you. Father, we pray for Hans. He is so ready to be at home and at rest with you. And we pray that you'd come to receive him and take him soon. As we wait and as he waits, Lord, we pray that you give him peace and just deep comfort in his soul. And we pray that thing, same thing for, for Lean and the whole family. Lord, in the midst of all uh, that's already going on in our lives, we have this ongoing pandemic. Feels a little bit like just perpetual cloud over top of us. Lord, we pray for endurance that we might continue to face each day with, uh, with your strength. We pray too that you'd keep us healthy and strong we pray for the health workers, Lord. We lift them up and ask that you continue to guide them, bless them, and care for them, especially as perhaps they'll be getting more patients in the hospital soon. We pray that you protect us, Lord, and we pray that there be some way out of this deep, dark fog sometime soon. 
Next week, there's a big election in in the States, Lord, and it has potential to just be disruptive and um, a difficult time. Uh, Lord, we pray for peace. We pray that these elections would be fair and that good process would be followed um, and that polling stations would not be um, targets, but that uh, this process would go ahead uh, peacefully and fairly. And may um, justice be done, and may good leadership be installed. Lord, there are many other people on our minds and our hearts or other situations that are happening in the world, and we pray now for those things quietly on our own. Our Father, we rest in your sovereign care and um, we join our voices in prayer with all those who have come before us in the faith by speaking aloud the Lord's Prayer. Hear us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Please stand. Jesus Christ is Lord of the church. He holds us in his hand, the church universal, but also our community here in Victoria. We can live and minister and face the future with hope, knowing that he will not neglect his church. Let's follow him as servants in the world and go in the power of God's blessing. May God go before you to lead you, behind you to protect you, beneath you to support you, and beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We all said together, Amen. Sing one final song.